Welcome back to the Scarlet Faithful Podcast. I'm your host and co-founder, Aaron Brightman, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome in Jerry Carino, uh, the Dean of the College Basketball Beat in New Jersey, and obviously covering Rutgers and Seton Hall for many years now. It's always a pleasure to have you on and talk to you, Jerry. Uh, how's it going, and thanks for being here. I feel like we have a nice November tradition, right? Me coming on right before the season starts, really t- us really talking at length, chopping it up, you know, all all hoops, uh, preview stuff. I love it. This is my time of year, Aaron. I, I say this, I've said this to you before. I really appreciate the October, November uh, preview stuff and the people who are into it because those are the real fans. Those are the people who who are with you the whole way. You know, as a as a beat writer for or for a team. You know, as a fan, uh, a lot of people pile on in in January, February, and especially March, and that's fine. That's okay. It's part of the sport, but. But the folks that are listening to this and we're with us now, like that's those are our people, you know. And so yeah. I'm so glad to do this for them. Well, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for being here. And I totally agree with the sentiment. And um, I always love the people that hate being optimistic this time of year, too, where this is the time to be optimistic. And, uh, you know, I, I think for Rutgers fans, it's an interesting time. It's a fascinating kind of new season ahead, uh, new dynamics to the team. Uh, I first wanted to start just with your first impressions from Sunday, the exhibition win against Fairfield. So first of all, Fairfield's a pretty good team. You know, that's an upper tier MAC team. Uh, they're well coached, and uh, there's a chance they could win that league. And you know, you saw what the team that won that league did last year in March. <laughs> so it was a good test. You know, Fairfield's tough. Uh, Rutgers played well. I thought they played well. Uh, you know, Cliff did what you thought he was going to do. Mawad Mag was terrific and showed you that he's he's taking the next step, ready to be a contributor. And they did, you know, they won by what 14 or 15 without without Caleb McConnell. So and that showed you a lot. Uh, Rutgers looked good. The uh, a couple of things, Cl- you know, Cliff looked really comfortable shooting. I've seen him shoot it in practice, but it's different in game action against a good defensive team. He looked comfortable facing up from you know 18 feet from 23 feet. I mean, he's he does, if he does that even semi regularly, it's yeah. going to be you know that guy's going to be unbelievable. So he was even good as good as or even better than I thought. Thought the the ball movement was terrific, really good. Which you're going to get, I think, with Paul at the helm, right? Unselfish guy. But the, the offense ran well. I thought like Mawat Mag was a good surprise. Uh, the uh, you know Rutgers didn't rebound all that well. Fairfield kind of broke even with them on the boards. Uh, could be a one-off. You know, Jay Young does coach rebounding really hard. Uh, mm-hmm. So we'll see about that again. Caleb's not in the game. He's always good for, you know, five or six boards. Uh, and then the one the one thing that was surprising to me is that Steve only played – he played all of his starters 30-plus minutes. I was mm-hmm. very surprised by that. For someone who, who loves a deep rotation, who loves to play his bench in a non-conference, knowing the game, you know, it didn't matter who won the game or what the margin was. Uh, I was surprised that no one on that bench, other than uh, other than Derek Simpson, who was terrific, and I'll mention him in a second, got a lot of run. So I don't know what that means, but it was it was eye opening to me. And because last year, as you know, they had depth problems, and we were basically only playing five or six guys down the stretch. Uh, and then I want to say mention Derek Simpson, who I decided to focus on in my in my story. Because you know, I've seen, I've watched Derek since he was at Lenape High School. I live only a couple miles from the school. I've always thought that he was the next guy, you know, the next uh, un- undiscovered gem that that Pykele and his staff found. He that where they were going to polish up, and he was going to fit in great. And everything I've seen from him this preseason has told me that the way the way he's looked in the three times I've seen him practice, the way he looked in that game, shooting the ball, driving, uh, he just looks so comfortable and ready. Now he's not a big guy. He's going to have to bulk up. That's probably going to take like a whole year. But uh, as far as like the moxie and the, the skill set and the explosion, the burst, but he's got it. So that's the one guy you know is going to contribute for them out of these newcomers or role players or whatever. So I thought that was a real positive. So there's mostly good, like I said, wondering about the minutes. Uh, but, yeah, the team looks good. And when it's back in the spring, you know, when the Ross was finalized, Aaron, I, it I thought it smelled like an NIT team. Like I thought this was a high end NIT team. I no longer think that. After seeing them four times, including the one exhibition, I do think it's an NCAA tournament team. And uh, yeah, I agree with you. I th- that did stick out to me. The lack of minutes for the bench, 
Um, but then, you know, as I've been thinking about it over the week, I don't know. I mean, of those, of the six that played pretty much exclusively, three of them were kind of new in terms of, you know, playing bigger roles. And I, I wondered if maybe Michael wanted to give them, you know, kind of a full run in a game that didn't count just to see how they did. And uh, because I, I thought Andre Hyatt too, he, he was, you know, he's a guy I'm kind of worried about is it, what role is he going to play? Is Mag going to kind of pass by him and is he still going to be engaged? And I thought, I thought he was efficient and, and looked, uh, you know, it's kind of into the game as, as, as he did at all at, at any point last year. That was the best I saw from Hyatt. So the four, the four times I've seen Rutgers, that was the first time Hyatt stood out. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's big, that's big for them because you know he, he does have potential. And I think the staff has been really working hard to unlock that potential. So yes, he was, he was a revelation. Best thing I really saw from him for sure. Uh, but you know, coaches don't like to be asked about minutes. Uh, they hate it. In fact, Steve is no exception. And, you know, he didn't really want to get into, you know, who, who wasn't feeling well, why somebody got three minutes or five minutes, uh, not in his post game. So I, it's hard to answer that question, but yes, I will agree that they, the staff has really been zeroing in on getting more out of Hyatt. And that was a sign that game was a sign that it's working. So obviously coming into this year, you know, a big adjustment, your, your top two, uh, you know, faces of the program for, for years and basically the, the you know, the, the leaders of the, the, the coming of age of this program in the modern day with Harper and uh, Harper Jr. and Gio. Uh, but this team seems to almost be, it's a different team. The chemistry is different. They're younger. They're, it's more of a blend of young and old. Um, it's almost like they've turned the page faster than maybe we have or fans have. Um, and it just seems like they almost have a lightness about them in terms of, you know, turning the page and now being their own identity going into this season. I was curious your thoughts on that. Well, that's the natural ebb and flow of, of college sports, right, Aaron? It's been it's been a little bit uh, altered by, you know, the pandemic and the fifth year of eligibility. And, of course, the transfer portal and the constant changing and turning over of rosters, which Rutgers has largely avoided this year, which helps. But. Yeah, maybe it was just time, you know. So it's, it's sometimes in college, it's just time for someone else to take the mantle. And I mean, they, it's not like there's no experience. You have three experienced guys, uh, but th it, I haven't like in watching them so far. I haven't really seen a big drop off in the quality of play without you know Geo and Ron. Now, ask me again after they've played a bunch of Big Ten teams. Right. Uh, and the, you know, their Rutgers play has played an inordinate amount of close games that come down to the last minute. Like, ask me again after a, a five of those <laughs> if they miss Ron and Geo because those guys tended to do pretty well in those spots. But it, it I thought they'd be leaderless. I, I don't think they are leaderless. I think I think uh, Paul has taken up that, that mantle really well. And – uh you know, Caleb, the, 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 this, they have upperclassmen who've done that. So all, away from the games, like non-games, I think they've made the transition well. I'll get back to you on the games. But so far, so good. Well, and I think it really speaks to, you know, the health of the program. That This is a program now. I mean, it was with those guys, but this is really the next chapter in being a winning, successful program. And I think that that's why I think this year is so important to not have that drop off and be able to go back to the NCAA tournament. I think that's, it's a real prove it moment for Pykel to be able to say, Hey, you know, we're, we're a winning program regardless of who's in the uniform. Yeah, sure. I mean, a 30 year drought has now, you know, could now turn into three straight NCAA tournament appearances, four straight NCAA tournament caliber seasons, which, you know, was almost unthinkable five years ago. <laughs> right. So that's, that tells you something, but yeah, to lose the two, the two cornerstone, like foundational pieces, and to carry on as a contender would be a big statement. Now, uh, one I think one curveball that's happening to everybody in college sports is that these rosters are changing and that allegiances are loosening. So, uh, Steve has done a really good job of building culture to where his players have loyalty. And so, Caleb McConnell, could he have? You know, when he puts his name in the draft, uh, that's that's like catnip for the transfer portal schools mm -hmm. to, to reach out to him and his people uh, and try to pry him loose out of Rutgers. And don't think that didn't happen. But, you know, he, he wanted to stay. He wanted to be here. 
Uh, Paul, Paul Mulcahy, you know, he's had his fifth year of eligibility left. He's already graduated college. You think people are going to be trying to pry him loose? Uh, mm-hmm. But he, there's no way he's leaving. I mean, if he if he plays college ball next year, it's definitely going to be here. So same thing with Cliff. Now, this could be Cliff's last year, but Cliff's only going to one place. He's going to the NBA or to some major high-paying professional gig somewhere out of here. So there's a built-in loyalty that, that Steve has with these upperclassmen that I don't – and I think he would tell you this too, like in, a, in, a, in an honest moment. I don't know that you can count on that to continue. Like that is, it's incredible the the camaraderie and loyalty. And Steve and his staff get a lot of credit for that. And the, the type of players he's recruited and their families get a lot of credit for that. But these guys also didn't come up in the NIL environment. You know, they didn't come up in the pay to play environment. Like that took root when they were already pretty well ensconced at Rutgers. So, so I don't know that. This is gonna be something you better count on. And Steve has said he said it last year. Like this, this is a this program. This team is a dinosaur as far as the loyalty, the four or five year guys. This you know, this could be the end of that run. That doesn't mean that Rutgers won't continue to be good, but it'll be interesting interesting to see if Steve can continue to get guys who stay four years, five years, and develop the way he has. Because you're only gonna develop three star guys into really good college players if you have them for a couple of years. Like what if? Mawat Mag, you know, t- transferred out. You, then you wouldn't be seeing his his development here, his improvement. So there's there's loyalty there, and I don't, you know, can it continue? Nobody knows, but so far, so good. Well, and you've you've heard him talk like I have at length about recruiting, and you know the distaste for the portal and recruiting right. rankings. I mean, he went on that rant one time about recruiting rankings going all right. the way down to eighth graders, and uh, I guess. I, I find it fascinating just with the NIL dynamic with his recruiting approach. You know, he hasn't changed and he's still getting, like you said, he's keeping guys. Uh, and now you have Gavin Griffiths coming in. I mean, I feel like that's a dinosaur moment too. You're getting a top 30, top 40 guy and it's completely unrelated to NIL. Right. Uh, and, and I think that he has the ability to do that for over a sustained period. But of course you're only going to get so many guys that way. So I'm curious your thoughts on, the state of recruiting right now, obviously he's a huge get for this program, um, but just also what what you think they, they need to do uh, to finish out the 23 class. Well, it helps when you've had success, obviously. You know, you can sell success. That's, I think that still matters. Uh, I don't know how much the facility matters anymore. We talked about the practice facility. I mean, it, it helps the program. Like, it helps them function as a program, you know, that, that they have their own practice gym and they don't have to, like, work around – you know, the, all the events that are in the rack and the clubs that use it. I mean, that's good. Uh, but I don't know how much that helps them recruit anymore, but I do think success still matters. You know, it's, it can be, it can be damaging and negative recruiting when you don't succeed. So like Rutgers has basically answered those questions and that helps. Steve's going to recruit on relationships, you know, and that's the way he's going to do it. He knows he has uh, Gavin's family, he has roots with them. They go back a ways. Uh, they have some a lot of common acquaintances and friends that they have, and so that's what he's going to do. You know, he I heard a good story. This might have been, this might have been written. I think it was that Steve, uh, when he was in Gavin's house, like he noticed that Gavin had bunk beds, and he said, oh, "I grew up in a top bunk," you know, because he was like the last of eight or nine kids, and like that that really resonated with his family, uh, Gavin and his family, and you know, it might not resonate with somebody else who just wants to have their hand out. So they might not care about that. So uh, they were, but the Gavin and the Griffith family was able to identify with that. So I, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, you know, they, they, they're going to need some size for sure in the recruiting class. They are, they do have a lot of guards, but they're mm-hmm. going to need size because no one thinks Cliff's going to be here next year and you don't have much size beyond him. So that's obviously going to be a big thing, but is he going to be able to continue to pull guys like this out or find guys like Derek Simpson who you can coach up. I mean, he's done a pretty good job of it so far. So it's resourcefulness, right? Right, Aaron? Pikes has been a very resourceful recruiter doing things his way. And we'll see if he can continue to do that if the NIL becomes a thing. Now, I do – I happen to think that the NIL is – good. the marketplace is going to regulate – is going to write itself. Like, mm-hmm. I think at some point – this is not necessarily going to happen at Rutgers but because they're not very ensconced in this. But at some point, like these boosters who are giving – money to these recruits are going to stop doing it when recruits, you know, walk out the door after a year or, or don't, you know, or flop or, or mm-hmm. bust or whatever. 
or you know our discipline problems, people are going to stop doing it. So uh, that, I think it'll regulate itself. So I don't. It's hard to p- peer into the crystal ball and say what's going to happen there. But but what Steve has done is working, and they are. I mean, you see this. They are in the mix for more high-profile players than they ha- ever have been mm-hmm. uh, in the, in the modern in a recent era for sure. Yeah, actually, next week, uh, five-star center by fall uh, has represented his top four. He took an official visit. Uh, you know, Arkansas is involved, Alabama is involved. But, I mean, to have Rutgers, you know, five-star center, in, in have Rutgers in your top four, uh, I, I don't ever remember that happening, um, you know, even a higher-rated recruit than Cliff. So I agree with you. I think it's just fascinating how he has stayed the course. You've said this before. Even just the way he's rebuilt the program, he's done it his way the whole time. Right. Uh, and it's not even his way in terms of making Rutgers out of nothing, but it's like you don't really see it anywhere in terms of his approach and how he's kind of stayed the course. And, you know, he hasn't changed. And I always ask the players this at Media Day, you know, has Pico's message ever changed since you were recruited by him, since you've been here? And they all say his message never changes to them when they're on the in the program. Yeah, I mean he's won he's won a lot of games, you know. Stone, include Stony Brook, eleven years there. He's these guys won a lot of basketball games, so he's he's not going to change much. Uh, but I will, I do take note of subtle things that he does differently. And I will tell you one thing: Steve has done differently this year. And no, it was not scheduling, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but he did. Steve did. He did tone down the prognostications. The you know the. The uh the I don't want to say chess beating, but the he toned down like the rhetoric about how good they're going to be. Like he last year was the best team I've ever coached. The, my be, my center position is going to be way better. Not you're not getting as much of that this year. It's more cautious. I still think he's very high in his team and believes it can be good. But he under he learned a little lesson last year about you know pumping things up in the preseason and then it, and maybe it's Stony Brook like it didn't that didn't come back to haunt him, but you know, everybody's under a microscope in the high major level. So that got thrown in his face a lot last year. And he did, he is, he's making a more conscious effort to, to be a little more cautious about his words. And the other thing Steve did that was different this year is, and this is a really tangible thing. He changed their, their scrimmage regimen. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he, uh, last year they, they beat UConn in a scrimmage. They played well against Villanova and they came out of those scrimmages flying high thinking like, we're just going to show up and win. And we saw the result of that, right, in the non-conference schedule. Yeah. So Steve, this year, took, got the hardest possible scrimmage he could. I think he said to himself, like, what's the hardest scrimmage I can get for my team? And it's the number one team on the road. You know, it doesn't get any harder. You know, <laughs> if he scrimmaged in uh, Hubert Davis's living room, maybe that would have been the only harder thing he could have done. I don't know. Well, the Dean Dome's kind of like his living room, so. Yeah, so <laughs> that was – he wanted – Steve wanted his team to be – humbled or at least to see that there's work to do like he was he wanted North Carolina to bring their a game in that scrimmage and so and then he scheduled an exhibition game because you know he wanted to change things because it didn't work last year Mm -hmm. so he does Steve does he does he's not dumb I mean he does understand that sometimes you gotta maneuver a little bit and adjust and that's two ways I've seen him adjust his preseason yeah, that's a really good point about the scrimmages. And uh, when I had him on the podcast and over the summer, I did ask him about last year and calling it his best team. And he, he kind of smirked. And you know, <laughs> he, he actually said it first publicly uh, on my podcast at On the Banks. And I said to him, you know, you kind of, are you not going to say it? And he goes, I'm never going to say that again. And he will never you know, he, say it again. He was still kind of bitter that, you know, the, the he he took. But I, I loved, I actually thought it was a, a big part of why they turned last season around because he was adamant he would not back down from it. And uh, he kept saying that this is my best team. He stood by it. And I, I think that that maybe helped a little bit for them to turn things around. Could be, uh, but he won't. Yeah, you're right. He'll he'll never say those words again. There's no question about it. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's coaching too. You got to make adjustments, you know? So I think like recruiting wise, he's not going to change who he is, but he might, he might make some adjustments as needed. Uh, retention wise, he might make some adjustments as needed. Like he, he doesn't. Steve doesn't like the NIL, but he's not going to totally ignore it. Right. Uh, he doesn't like the transfer portal, but he's not going to totally ignore it. You know, he's he's used it a little bit. So that's I think that's what you're going to get, out of Steve. He'll do what he has to do, but stick to his principles. So, uh, in terms of, and I know you're not the biggest fan of Ken Palm, but uh, with the <laughs> with the projections this year, uh, 
you know, I, I was kind of surprised, and I know that people are concerned about the offense because obviously Gio and Ron Harper, the top two scorers the last three years. I wrote about this today. I actually, I, I'm more excited about the offense. I think ba- they can be more balanced. I think with the, the sharing of the basketball, with Mulcahy as the perfect facilitator, I think Spencer allows them to space the floor more. Cliff being the focal point, playing the inside out game. I actually think that, I, I don't know if they'll be higher scoring, but I think they'll be more efficient. Yeah, it could, I, could, could be. could be right. So I guess my concern actually is on the defensive end. I, I'm worried they're not going to be as, as close to an elite defensive team. Uh, you know, the guards, I think, you know, will be vulnerable a little bit against smaller, quicker, uh, more athletic guys. Um, I guess your thoughts on what you've seen from them the four times you've seen them uh, on the defensive end. Yeah, that's why I think Derek Simpson is such a huge piece of this team, right? Look, mm-hmm. look, he's not, Derek's not going to start. He's not going to get the minutes Geo Baker got as a freshman because the program's better now. And the backcourt is pretty deep once Caleb is back. But that's why he's he's going to be really important for because uh, they're going to need some speed on that perimeter. And they're not going to have they're not going to have great lateral quickness uh, when Paul and, and Cameron and their other backcourt. They're mm-hmm. going to be vulnerable to being driven past. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a concern. Steve's going to have to mix and match because he has an elite perimeter defender in Caleb McConnell. I think Simpson's got a lot of promise as a defender, although he is small and it is, it's harder to learn defense than it is to learn offense at college. The adjustment from being in high school to college is always steeper on defense, especially in defensive minded programs like the one Steve runs. Uh, so we'll see with Derek. Like I thought Derek was really good offensively in, against Fairfield. He was not great defensively. You saw him foul. He fouled three times because he was out of position, but he'll learn, you know, he has the physical tools to do it. Uh, Yes, so I could see that. I've kind of gone both ways on it. I could see where defensively, uh, perimeter-wise, it could be an issue for them. And also Cliff, you know, Cliff was not – he was okay last year defensively. He Mm -hmm. wasn't great. He was better in terms of not fouling as much, right? He reduced his foul rate a lot from his freshman year. But uh, he he was not an elite defender by any means. He was, I think he was an average to slightly above average defender last year. So he's got to get better, and I think he will. He's, he's He's a good learner. He's like a sponge. You know, he's got the physical tools to get better. So, yeah, it could be an issue with the backcourt for sure. And I don't know. It would be interesting to see if they play some zone. I know Steve Steve kind of looks down on zone a little bit. Like he, he's a man-to-man guy, you know, and that's the way basketball should be played. Old school. But, yeah, again, he's going to he's gonna do what he has to do. So it would be interesting to see if he uses zone or tries to tweak things to help protect his guards a little bit when he's got that one line up on the floor. Yeah, I was I was wondering what you thought about that because I, I think he hates the zone because it hurts rebounding. I've always that thought could be that. too. I mean, it is it is harder to rebound out of a zone, uh, for sure. And they haven't rebounded well the last few years. They've been an average, not bad, not a bad team, not like Eddie Jordan era rebounding, <laughs> but they have not rebounded well. Like from his standards, they've been average the past couple of years. So yeah, when you go into a zone, it's harder to rebound. Sure, that's like a basic thing. But so yes, it will be interesting to see how he balances these things and. I just don't think he likes playing zone. I, I think he feels like it doesn't bring out the aggression and toughness that he wants in his defenders. So we'll see if he does do – you know, he's done it before, just not as a steady diet. So we'll see what he does there. So I've been wanting to ask you this one. This goes back to offense. And I, I he, he always talks about it in the preseason, transition offense. Uh-huh. We, we heard a lot of it this preseason that they're going to run more. They're going to be – you know, get out and transition more. You know, is this actually the year that these – I mean, last year I thought they were very, very effective at times in transition. Whenever they, uh, you know, scored double digits in transition, they usually won. I'm curious of your thoughts if you think that that's – is it a stylistic issue? Is Michael always going to want to kind of make it a grind that, you know, that speed limit 65? Or do you think that they have the tools this year to be, be more effective in transition? I've heard him use the line, uh, the uh... – the first 10 seconds of the, of the shot clock is yours and the next and the rest of it's mine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so like he, yeah, basically if you, if the guys can get out and run, do it, but uh, he, he doesn't want people to force it. Like he doesn't want stuff to be forced. He wants it if it's there. And they were good at times in that last year with that last year. Mm-hmm. We'll see. I, I don't know if this team, is this team going to be capable of that? I don't know. Uh, they don't, Again, they're not going to have a particularly fast backcourt. They have a they have a pretty big, physically big backcourt. They have a long backcourt. Uh, you know, McConnell and Simpson could be fast, but if they're together, 
but yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. Uh, Cliff, I thought, I think is getting better at throwing the outlet pass. Like Miles Johnson was really good at that. That's yeah. a big part of transition offense too, off of rebounds. Sure. So it's a good question. Uh, I don't know, but you're right. He, but every coach says they want to play fast, right? And then it, a lot of times it doesn't happen. But Rutgers has gradually, over the course of Peichel's tenure, they've gradually picked up the pace and been more opportunistic in transition. They were decent at that last year. I don't think they'll be any better than that this year, but they could be in that ballpark. It's never going to be their thing. Like They're never going to score 90, 80 a game. Peichel doesn't want to do that. Right. You know, but, but, yeah, could they run some? Possibly. We'll see. So the question that uh, is going to give me anxiety and probably every Rutgers fan listening, what do you what are your thoughts on Caleb McConnell just in terms of dealing with this injury? And um, I, I know we don't know time frame, but just what are your thoughts on the situation heading into the season? They have to they have to be as cautious as humanly possible, because if he rushes back and he hurts himself more or worse, it's the team's going to have a huge problem. I mean, how are you going to defend the perimeter without him? Yeah. Not to mention the leadership and what I think is going to be a better scoring player. Like there's a guy who willfully deferred to Ron and Gio, uh, but you saw at times what he could do offensively when he got into a rhythm. So I think it could be a double figure score, no problem. And he can get to the rim, which not everyone can, mm -hmm. you know, on this team, he can in their backcourt, he can get to the rim. Uh, but defensively they, they're going to be, they'll struggle without him. So, they have to do everything possible to be cautious. Like do not rush him back. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, Steve trusts his players to tell them, tell him like I'm ready. And, but, and Caleb, he's been through the mill and he's tough as nails, but like extra, take the extra step. And if he misses a few games, which may well happen, he misses a few games, but you cannot, you need him there in December. And if he, if you have to sit him for November, you sit him till he's right. But, yeah, it's a big concern because, you know, at first it was a tweak, and now we're going on week four of a tweak. Mm -hmm. So, like, week four is not really a tweak. Week four is you have a knee injury. Now, it's not an ACL because we wouldn't – it would be gone. If it was an ACL, they would have put the announcement out. He'd be in mothballs. It'd be, the season would be over. It's not an ACL, but it's more than a tweak, okay? And so they need to, they need to put him – be super-duper cautious with him. Yeah, and I just think, you know, as successful as the, the team has been the last few years, every year at the beginning of the – I mean, Geo twice, you know, getting hurt in the beginning. Uh, you know, Ron went through that little bit of a, a skid uh, two years ago. Yeah, Cliff was hurt his freshman year. Yeah, Cliff missed a few games. Um, you know, it's just like – and Caleb, I mean, he's been more injured than anybody. He play. I mean, the guy plays so hard too. That's part of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Caleb, I, Caleb plays his reckless abandon, and that's, that's just who he is. Another All the more reason – not to rush him back. Like you don't need him re-injuring that knee against Columbia or, <laughs> or, you know, sacred heart. You don't need that. No, no. And he doesn't know how to play any other way. And uh, that's what I think. I think his toughness just on the court, this team needs that badly. So yeah, certainly uh, a concern going in, which leads to my next question, just in terms of your thoughts on the big 10. Uh, you know, I, I've been kind of vocal about, I think Rutgers is being undervalued. Uh, they have this, the second most kind of returning production compare, uh, besides Indiana. Uh, obviously, you know, the other programs have, you know, all these five-star recruits coming in, uh, Ohio State, uh, Illinois, Michigan. Um, but I, I don't know. I just – I feel like they're not getting the benefit of the doubt that they should be. And what are your, what's your kind of thoughts on how it's kind of projected going into the year? Part of that is – and you're right, Aaron, but part of that is a deference to Ron and Gio, right, because – they were really well respected by the coaches. Like they, they struck fear in the heart of opposing coaches. And so a lot of, you know, and, and the media members understood that too, for them, that how good those two guys were. So a lot of, I don't think there's as much anti buy -bi, anti Rutgers bias there as there is overly, not overly, but like a lot of respect for Ron and Gio. And so, you know, people see those two marquee guys leaving and figure Rutgers is going to take a step back. Uh, but you're, you're right. This is a great, so the great test case this year in can Rutgers cohesion. The fact that they have this experience, you know, they're the second most experienced team in the league, probably after Indiana, which obviously is the most, yep. they're probably the second most experienced team Rutgers. And that's definitely the second most in terms of quality experience, like guys who've had success. Yep. So, so uh, can, can cohesion 
can Rutgers cohesion is that is that going to be better than the just a pure firepower that Illinois is cobbling or Ohio State has brought in? You know, is what's greater in the end of the day? And so this is going to be a good test case for that because the Big Ten has endured a ton of turnover this year. They've lost a lot of good players. And I think the league is going to take a step back. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing for Rutgers because they could take a step forward. But I, I do think the league will not be as good as they were. So, and the, a lot of a lot of this like feeling of the rankings in the Big Ten is based on just purely the personnel some of these teams have. But you you know this from just from watching the way Rutgers plays and watching the sport. That's only that's only like half the battle. Mm-hmm. The other half is can these guys play together? So. You know, look at Memphis last year. Look at all the talent that Memphis had. Yeah, you know they had the f- scratch and claw to get in the NCAA tournament. So I know that's a particularly poorly coached program, but but you get the idea that this doesn't mean just because you have a lot of talent doesn't mean it you're going to be good. And so this is a good test case for that. But I do think the league takes a step back, which in a way is good because Rutgers could move up. Like you could easily see Rutgers finishing in the top four again. Uh, mm-hmm. But the same token, the league taking a step back also means that Rutgers got to do the job at a conference. Because right. the league schedule, it might not buoy them. You know, getting to, to 10 wins, uh, 11 wins, it's not going to have the same booing effect that it did last year when it, it made up for the sins of November and December. And so that is going to be an important thing because you're not going to, you know, you, you might not get nine Big Ten teams in a, in a dance. It might be six. And you got you to gotta take care of your business if you're Rutgers before you get into league play. Yeah, that's a good point. Margin for error is definitely uh, tighter this year. I, I did want to add, though, I, I agree with what you're saying. Ron and Gio had that respect, but they were picked eighth last year too. Uh, that was that was that was poor last year. The picking being being picked eighth was poor. I, yeah, that, that was, was a terrible job. But I agree. I think they they definitely earned respect, and uh, obviously their impact on the program, uh, you know, will never be forgotten uh, at, at all. Um, but I wanted to ask, just in terms of the dynamics of the Big Ten, you know, uh, Kevin Willard, who you know well at Maryland yeah. now, uh, you know, they're a little bit down. I mean, last year people were picking Iowa and Wisconsin to be down. That didn't in the True. big case. Right. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I mean, is this as wide open as kind of a, a league has been yes. um, since Rutgers has been in it? Yes, yes. The answer to that is yes. There's no question. And, look, it is, it, like as you alluded to, it is the Big Ten is a very well-coached league. This is a destination league for coaches. The the people coaching in this league have made it, you know, in their profession for mm-hmm. the most part. And so you have really good coaches, which means, yes, teams are going to be good. who You might not think are good, like in Iowa last year, like Wisconsin last year, because those coaches are really good. Uh, so that is certainly factored, needs to be factored in when we're looking on paper and assessing the league for sure. Uh, yeah, so can – you know, can is Maryland will be a fascinating case. Like we can get into Willard in a minute, but uh, you know they have a, some talent, but not a ton. What's he going to be able to do with them? You know, I don't know. But yeah, th- there's going to be some surprises in the league. Uh, Rutgers does have continuity, which should really help. I mean, that's that's something that's got to matter. And you're probably right, Aaron. They should be higher than than seventh, eighth. You know, there's probably a little bit of it's Rutgers in there. Uh, it's probably a mix of things. Like I mentioned, the losses and a little bit of maybe people just haven't figured out yet that Rutgers is here to stay. Only Big Ten team to have two players on the National Player of the Year can, um, watch list for, by position. That's a great uh, uh, job by noticing that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, that stood out to me the fact that, you know, th- that they got recognized like that, Kayla McConnell. I mean, but- yeah, that's big. So, like, it's why it is wide open in the sense that, like, could some other team win it? Yeah. Look, I don't. Everybody knows. I don't. I don't want to pick Indiana to win a league, <laughs> but like objectively, you don't have a choice. I mean, they made the NCAA tournament last year and bring the, pretty much the whole team back, including an All-American. You know, you, it, it hurt me deep down inside to pick them first, and to rank someone. Someone emailed me and said you you spend years, three years bashing Indiana, and you put rank them twelfth in the AP poll. <laughs> I'm like, well, I I can understand why you would say that, and it kind of does make me look like a like dummy or like a hypocrite, but. <laughs> you, when you look at it on paper, I mean, they it wasn't like they were bad last year. They did make it, and they right. won a game. They won their first four game, and they bring everybody back. And when you look at it relative to what everyone else brings back, you, you kind of – they're by default the top team. But, yes, I, I'm not going to bet my house on them winning the Big Ten. No shot. 
So <laughs> it is more wide open. Like it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be like the cluster of powers at the top that they've had for these last several years for sure. Yeah, and I think Indiana, as, as much experience they have back, I mean, they're going to have to prove that they can shoot. Uh, they, they really – that was one area they struggled in, and, you know, they lost their best shooter, so Parker Stewart. So I, I feel like, you know, that's a question mark for them that could, you know, end up being an issue. We'll see what they're made of when they come here in early December. Yep. If yeah, they so were, if that's going to be – that the arena is going to be nuts. Yep. Probably the, the, one, the one of two crazies is going to be all year. Seton Hall will be crazy. Also, but that that probably be the nuttiest game of the whole year, I would think, in terms of the intensity and volume in the arena. If Indiana walks out of there with a win, that will tell you that they're for real. Good point, and that's a good segue. I wanted to ask you about Seton Hall. Obviously, with Shaheen Holloway taking over for Willard, uh, just your kind of thoughts on his uh, early start there, and also what dynamic he's going to bring to the rivalry with Rutgers and Seton Hall. Well, he's done a good job putting a roster together that can be competitive. Uh, very good job. And, you know, we've there's been a lot written and said about the NIL issues Rutgers has uh, trying to raise raise money to retain players. Forget about not even getting into recruiting. And Seton Hall has the same issues to scale. You know, they don't have football, but they have the same issues to scale that Rutgers has with the NIL. So like, he's done a good job getting – job number one for Holloway – was to get a roster together that could be competitive. And he did that. Uh, he brought in transfers. He brought in a really talented freshman, Tay Davis, from Indianapolis. And, you know, he has he, he got enough decent guys to return. The, Holloway's an interesting guy. Uh, he's he, What he did was at St. Peter's was incredible. His whole life has really been incredible. I mean, terrific player. You remember him as a player. Yep. Terrific, gritty, uh, winning point guard. And he's, he's had just huge success. Uh, as an assistant coach to Kevin Willard, like really helped Willard lay the foundation for Seton Hall's emergence as a consistent contender. And then what he did at St. Peter's is an all-time great job. You know, it may never be repeated. Mm -hmm. So the guy's a winner, uh, and, but he's he's different than Kevin, you know. And his, his, I think he's like a bull in a china shop over there where his, where his expectations are, what he the way he wants his guys to play. And uh, how can I say this for a family podcast? <laughs> His tolerance of BS is very low, uh -huh. very low. And so you've seen him say some things that like other coaches think, but won't say, and he just says them. Yeah. So it, it makes it interesting. And I, you know, I don't know what they're going to be this year. Like I have, I've only seen Seton Hall twice. I've seen Rutgers four times. Uh, I don't, I don't know what they're going to be. It's a big mystery to me, but I will say that I think Shaheen will embrace the rivalry with Rutgers. He'll embrace the series of the Garden State Hardwood Classic. He, he, he played in it. He played in some really great games in it. You know, an epic one at the, at the rack uh, in 2000 that went into double overtime with Rashad Kent and the timeout technical foul, right? I was there that night. I was sitting in the 300s. Yeah. I had, Aaron, I had, I may have said this on your podcast before. I don't remember. I had, I had my winter jacket stuffed with airplane bottles of booze. I, I, I was didn't... nipping on them. And the, yeah, I was there as a civilian, you know, I was nipping on them at the 300 level. Uh, it was it was a Wednesday night at like nine o'clock. Yeah, it was an epic game. I mean, so he, Shad, he gets it. You know, he he gets it, and he Jersey guy, New York guy, through and through. Uh, and I, he likes Steve. They like each other. And mm -hmm. I, not that Kevin and Steve didn't like each other, but I think there seems to be like a mutual respect there uh, between. I think Shad Steve have a rapport. They have a they have developed a rapport, and so. It's going to really help the series, and I think he'll embrace it. And you know, I think he'll like coming here to the rack. Like he, he'll enjoy that that atmosphere, toughening his team up and fighting uphill against it. I, Kevin did not enjoy that. Like, and he, for to his credit, he said it. <laughs> you know, Kevin didn't enjoy it. It was like torture for Kevin. And I think I think Shaw will feed off that a little bit. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, just a, a quick segue to that game, 2000. I was, so that was my senior year at Rutgers. Huh. And uh, I, I also indulged in some alcohol. And I got my friends. I talked them into painting ourselves red, right? That game was on ESPN. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nine o'clock game. So I said, we're going to paint ourselves red. We're going to get in the student section. We're going to get on TV the whole game. Well, we took too long. We were driving from College Ave. We got stuck in traffic. We're drinking booze on the way there. And 
we got the wrong paint that restricts on it, it tightens it stiffens the skin oh no and i had a buddy that <laughs> enamel paint so yeah so we ended up yeah it was a rookie move uh, i made a mistake so oh my god we're at the top of the bleachers the tv cameras cannot see us we're you know not in a great state my buddy falls down a couple rows he ends up you know in the bathroom and uh actually on face down ends up in the hospital Jeez. Oh, after the game and then yeah losing in overtime and i, I I've, I've written this before but i walk walk into the parking lot after the game and i'm like reality hit that my college life was coming to an end oh. new world was coming it all came to, to fruition in my head and i could see my future as no no not no longer a college student after that aren't, aaron aren't you aren't you glad that they did not everything was videotaped and photographed back then <laughs> Yeah, if you could do stuff like that, and then it didn't haunt you forever, right? You know? Right. Well, well I miss, I missed the. Not that I need that now, but boy, I'm glad we we got it in when we did. Yeah, and the, the best part of the story is I went to the hospital to see my friend after, and we walk in, and we're still in paint, and they're like, "He's over there," because we all walked in in paint. Oh, uh, they knew who they, you they were. Knew, they knew who we were looking for. So, oh man, what a anyway, story. He, he, he worked out. He turned out fine. So, thank um, goodness. But. <laughs> Segway and just in terms of college hoops in New Jersey, you know, when I was growing up, I lived near Princeton. So I went to go, you know, Pete Carell, obviously, rest in peace. Uh, I went to see his team as many times. And that Rutgers-Princeton rivalry, which we've talked about. Yeah, terrific. Uh, was amazing. Miss, miss it. We miss it. We miss it. Absolutely. And Jadwin Jim is, you know, people that haven't been, it's a great place to see a game. Unique. Absolutely. So what what, what are your thoughts on Princeton, uh, you know, and Ryder, obviously on, on Rutgers' schedule? But just New Jersey basketball, the other six teams aside from Seton Hall Rutgers. You know, I wrote this. I wrote this earlier this week, Aaron. I think this is the most excitement there's ever been surrounding New Jersey basketball in a preseason. Since mm -hmm. I've been in the 20 years I've been on a job, like 20 years, this is my 20th year on a beat. I think this is the most excitement there's ever been because you have Rutgers and Seton Hall in good places as programs coming off NCAA tournament appearances with returning guys. Uh, you have St. Peter's doing what they did. They're not going to be that again, but doing what they did just elevates that whole school and that program. Uh, and then, you know, you have Princeton, which is consistently good. And they were going to be really good. They won the Ivy regular season last year, lost the, the championship game to Yale in the tournament, the Ivy League tournament. Their picks finished second this year behind Penn. I think they're going to be just as good as Penn, if not better. Uh, and they host – Princeton hosts the, the Ivy League tournament this year, mm. which is big. So, yeah, that's – they're really good. Tosan, uh, the – the last name's a tough one. There's the, the the big man, the center. Yeah. I'm not I'm not a TV guy. His last name's <laughs> harder than Cliffs. He <laughs> he is legit. Like he's an NBA prospect. A six. He's like a six nine, positionless guy. And they have shooters. Princeton. They're really good. So I think they'll be a top hundred type team. Uh, I can see them getting in the NCAA tournament and giving somebody a fit. And they'll, so they'll be fun to see. And then. You know, the other teams, Ryder's probably the next best team. They have a chance to win the MAC after Manhattan imploded uh, just a couple weeks ago, firing the coach, losing their best player. Yep. They, they move up to the top contender to unseat Iona, where Rick Pitino is flagrantly unhappy, apparently. <laughs> he looks like he is dying to get out. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, yeah, I think, I think Ryder has a chance. Like, they have good guards. You know, they, they beat Iona last year. That was sort of the awakening. They beat mm -hmm. him in the MAC tournament that opened the door for St. Peter's. So Ryder's a contender. You could see them in, in, in March. So there's four, there's four New Jersey teams with NCAA tournament chances. Three made it last year. Hasn't been four since 1991. It's possible this year. And then you throw in, you know, your new coach at FDU, Tobin Anderson, who won a lot at the Division II level, who's really well-respected. He's a, a really well-known clinician, uh, in sought-after cl clinic speaker on – on full court pressure defense. So they'll be fun to watch and see how, what he does there at FDU. Uh, like I said, there's excitement around St. Peter's. Uh, I don't think it'll be terrible. They do bring three players back who played on the team last year. Uh, Bashir Mason is an accomplished head coach. So I think, and they'll have fans now at their games, which mm -hmm. will help them. You know, they basically were playing in empty gyms that will no longer be the case. So they'll be okay. Mama's, Mama's down reloading, but in a new league, the CAA, you know, they moved up. So they'll probably take some lumps, but it's exciting to see how they'll measure up as they move up the ranks. You know, they win the Northeast Conference not that long ago. Uh, so so that's a team to watch. And uh, NJIT 
has a, you know really good. They have a four star freshman. Uh, again, I hate to emphasize to go nuts about the stars, but it's NJIT. They have yeah. a four star recruit in the backcourt, Paul McMillan from uh, from Cincinnati. So, so that's interesting and and I think worth keeping an eye on. So, uh, yeah, there's this should be a fun year. There's a lot of excitement, I think, for all the fan bases, and and there's good reason to because New Jersey college basketball is humming along pretty nicely. We've waited a long time for the state to be in the point I think it is right now with so many programs having postseason aspirations. Oh, so years. I mean, there were there were wilderness years. I mean, Rutgers <laughs> fans, don't, they don't need to hear this from me. They know. <laughs> there were, but not just Rutgers. There were wilderness years for almost everybody other than Princeton, which has yeah. always been pretty good. There were wilderness years for almost everybody. Yeah, this is the this is the payoff for those of us who've been following the sport a long time. So two questions left for you. One real quick, uh, Jalen Llewellyn transfer from Princeton. is going to be the starting point guard, I think, for Michigan. How do you think he's going to make that adjustment? And, uh, you know, what does he bring to the table for Michigan? He's, I mean, he's a terrific, explosive player, right? Uh, he has Big Ten quality burst. Uh, he's long. Uh, and, you know, he can shoot. He's a streaky shooter, streaky shooter, but he can fill it up. So he can get to the rim. He can hit a three. The, the last guy who made, you know, Princeton had an Ivy League point guard two years ago. Mike Smith from Columbia was mm-hmm. a grad transfer, and he did really well. He ran that offense well, and yep. I think you'll see the same thing from Llewellyn. He'll, I don't know if he'll be all Big Ten, but he will be a solid Big Ten floor general, no question. All right, last question. Uh, season prediction time. What's your outlook for Rutgers? What are your thoughts on how far they can go, how well they'll do in the Big Ten? Let's Starting out of conference, look, the Rutgers – They'll have two real tests. I don't, I just maybe Temple will be better than I think. I don't think much of Temple right now. Uh, I know they do have some experience, and they're getting them on a neutral floor, which probably be mostly Rutgers fans. Let's be honest. Rutgers fans can go to Mohegan Sun. I don't see Temple fans going. But uh, so I think Rutgers really is the two tests, right? They got Seton Hall at home and and Miami on the road, and I don't. I, they're gonna. I don't see them doing worse in splitting those. I think they're better than Seton Hall at home on a neutral court, maybe comparable. So uh, ten and one at a conference. I don't. Maybe this is the year they don't have a landmine, right? Maybe this is the year that they've learned from the mistakes in the past and and show up every night and don't take that you know what the hell loss. Um, I'll, I'll go with that. And then in the in the league, I think the, you're slightly above five hundred. So maybe like eleven and nine. You know, there's room. There's, you're going to lose games in the Big Ten. It happens. But Rutgers, this group did show you they could win some on the road last year, which felt like a breakthrough. So that could carry over because some a bunch of these guys played in those games. So I have them at around 20, 21 wins, which should get you in the NCAA tournament. I think they'll be comparable to last year, like a double-digit seed. Maybe not the first four. Maybe they get into the outright bracket. But I, I foresee Rutgers returning to the NCAA tournament you know, in, as a double-digit seed. I think that's a reasonable expectation for this group. And once you get in, who knows? Like I can't tell you how far they're going to go. When you don't, the draw, who knows? But as a double digit seed, you know, we've seen it before, you got a chance. So, where, where does that uh, uh, say 11 wins? Where do you think that puts them in, in the standings in the Big Ten? Like maybe sixth. Sixth. You know, I mean, it could be, you could get into one of those wacky ties like they were in last year. Right. Yeah. Last year, they were fourth, but they, they were in a three or four way tie. Yeah. So, like fifth, sixth, seventh, something like that. You know, but I, I think in the top half, I would say the Rutgers finishes in the top half of the league. All right, so I lied. Last, last question. What's the okay. biggest key for Rutgers to do what you just said, to get to the NCAA tournament and win those 21 games? Well, they got. I mean, they got to keep Cliff healthy. Yeah. That's That goes without saying. Maybe that's just stating the obvious. But uh, Rutgers has to uh, – they got to just do what they do and not get sidetracked or caught up, like thinking, you know, like last year's team, maybe we can just show up and win. Or the opposite of that is when, and you know how the, you know how it gets in January and February when you're on that losing streak in the league, which always comes, you know that people are going nuts on the message boards, on social media, Pykele's emails, you know people people messaging the players, garbage. You know how that is. You gotta like stay tunnel vision. So I, if this team just has good leadership, keeps its head on its shoulders, you know doesn't get this distracted one way or the other, overconfident or doubts. To me, as long as they, st- they keep it together like that, I think they'll the – one thing about the Pykele regime is pretty consistent, you know. They've been pretty solidly in what they've done, and I 
I foresee them doing the same thing as long as they stay healthy. I don't I don't see that there's there's a lot of variable there. I think they're going to be in that 20 win range one way or another. Jerry Carino, the dean of the college basketball beat in New Jersey, the best source for college basketball in the state. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Really appreciate uh, your time and your thoughts and your insight. And I uh, hope college basketball fans enjoyed it. And uh, can't wait to have you back on again soon. Thanks for devoting so much time to the sport, Aaron. We love you for it. Well, thanks, Jerry. And uh, looking forward to the season.